Hey Chris, welcome to the Nelson Pod. Kia ora, it is great to have you on the show. Thank you Matt, nice to be here. So, um, so interesting talking to crime writers because we're all absolutely fascinated by crime. But you've also got an interesting backstory of your own and I believe your first novel, the, the inspiration or the thing that triggered it, was a bombing in, was it Sudan? I was working for Red Cross at the time and was up visiting a refugee camp and during the night the town got attacked and it was just after um, the attack in um, East Timor when all the United Nations workers, were, well a few United Nations were killed. So there was a great deal of angst and we were all quickly herded into the compound and while well, we tried to assess the security situation and um, you know, I always thought I was pretty stalwart and I actually found myself quite stressed. Yep. And um, I went into the bathroom and came out and someone gave me a book to read. So there was a lot of kerfuffle going on around the outside and, you know, gunfire. And and I thought, I'll just, I'll just read this book and I'll just concentrate on that. I and might be about to die, <laughs> but I'll read a book. No, but I'll read a book. Mm. I'll read a book because I need to. I need to remove myself from the from what was going outside. Because there's no point worrying about it. There was no point. It was. I was powerless. There was nothing I could do. And are we um, talking handguns? We're we talking machine well, guns. Well, we're talking. We're talking probably machine guns and bombs. Because I remember during the night, I thought, oh, someone's you know, someone's dropping off blood sacks of concrete. Right. But of course, it was it was bombing. Bomb. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, it was a book, the book I was reading was um, A Widow for a Year mm-hmm. by uh, John Irving. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, w- I can remember thinking, as I was reading it, because it was quite a good story, um, how it removed me, like it removed my head from where I was into, into the story. And um, I'd always wanted to be a writer, but I realised at that particular moment the power that a book can have on people and and uh, yeah, so I always knew that I was going to. I started writing after that actually, right? And um, I dedicated the the first book to a colleague that was working with me at the time in Sudan, um, and uh, because it was it was that episode that that really got me going. Mm. Mm. And so, what year was that? Two th- nineteen. Oh, 2000? A while ago. 2000, right. About 2000, So, so what, what happened? Did, did you keep reading the book and, and the attack ended? What, what went well, down? actually, what happened the next day, well, we were um, we all had to wait until we got the all clear uh, because we weren't sure whether the road down to Khartoum was going to be open and how safe it was, so we all went in convoy. Um, were you still reading the book? Well, I think I had the book with me. Uh-huh. I had to get to the end of it because... Uh, yeah, it was quite interesting, and uh, I remember um, so I lifted my head up because someone was speaking to me, and they said, you know, what are you reading? And I went, you know, don't disturb me, I'm reading. Yeah, yeah. I'm reading John Grisham's book for a year. Right. And this person said, oh, was that about the young child that watches a mother <laughs> being bonked? And I remember thinking, oh, it is actually. But um, Right. Yeah, so... So was it John Irwin or John John Grisham? Irving? John, John Irving. Irving. Oh, yeah, John yeah, yeah, Irving. Yeah, right. Widow for a year. I mm. think he's written, he's written, obviously he's written a few other books. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was just the ability to transport one out of out of one's one's space mm, and into totally. something else. And yeah, I did I did read read it, and I've often often thought about the influence John Irving's had yeah, on yeah. my life. Yeah, mm. interesting. It must uh, must be amazing to be an author and hear those sorts of stories about people reading your book or, you know, reading what you've written and, and, and having those experiences? Oh, look, I call myself a, a crime writer with a social conscience because it's not so much the events that you see in life, it's sometimes the events that you don't see mm-hmm. or you don't hear about or mm. you don't know. Um, you know, I saw a lot of things in my aid work that sat very uncomfortably with me in terms of lack of social justice, inequity, racism, um, you know, we we often talk about crime, and a crime is really only a crime if someone labels it, mm-hmm. or there's a legal system that says you're going to be charged with the crime. And I was often working in places where there was no legal system, or where crime, or where um, you know normal standards of behaviour had, had disappeared because of war and disasters and things. So I was always intrigued by the ambiguity of that could happen overseas and be be dismissed, mm. but if the same thing happened in another country, it would there would be a huge outcry about it, and it, and it still continues to this day. We can 
we can see atrocities happening overseas yeah. and go, oh, well, you know, what can we do about it? Mm. But if it happened in our own backyard, we'd so, be so up in arms. I'm very keen to talk about your, your work as a crime writer, but let's go back to this, this humanitarian work that you were doing. Um, grew up in Christchurch, mm-hmm. and then how did you go from being a kid growing up in Christchurch to working in places like Sudan? Well, I started off as a, um, as a I began as a nurse, when I was 17 years and three months old. Uh-huh. Was that significant? <laughs> well, I just always laughed that I graduated and wasn't allowed to drink. Oh, uh, OK. <laughs> that seems a bit unfair. A bit unfair in those days. Mm-hmm. And um, I ended up working in, in what's called primary health care. And I don't know if you remember, but there was a huge input in the early um, 70s to have health for all by the year 2000. It was the big U- UN goal. Um, and primary health care, which was really focused on prevention of people getting into hospital, of huge, you know, of addressing chronic disease, of keeping communities well and healthy and not relying on the ambulance at the end of the cliff, a hospital system. And I became um, one of the first practice nurses in New Zealand. And, um, and then I went to university uh, as a mature student once I graduated and studied art history and social sciences sort of really got more and more into yeah. social uh, mm. and social justice issues. And then after about five years at uni, I thought, you know what, I could really do with a decent bottle of wine and, a, and some bread. I'm going overseas for a year. Uh-huh. And the lots of nurses were going to Saudi Arabia after the Gulf War. Mm. So there was my first experience of working in a post-war zone. And I ended up having three, three more post-war zones that I worked in. Um, so, so this was... This was After. in the. I started off in about the mid 90s. By this stage, it was the mid 90s, 90, 91, mm-hmm. 1991, the end of, the, of Saudi Arabia. And I was sent off to this incredibly remote part of northern uh, Saudi Arabia, which was so Bedouin. Mm. And I'd gone from being a radical left wing, you know, lefty feminist to suddenly having to cover my head and be right. really subservient and, mm-hmm. and quiet. And How was that? Oh, tough for me. <laughs> Very tough. Uh, but I did it because um, because I knew I somehow knew this was where I was 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 going to be. This mm-hmm. is this was kind of like my bit of a destiny for me, and I loved the fact that the whole of the Middle East at that particular time, particularly Saudi Arabia, was unknown. Like they were just Arabs. I mean, everyone just called them Arabs, mm-hmm. and you know. And um, suddenly I was in this whole cultural world where my my head had to be covered. Um, everything was upside down. The weekends were Thursday, Friday. Um, you know, we, we lived by a different set of rules. Mm. It was a huge cultural shock. Mm-hmm. Um, but somehow I loved it. And and you're there working for who? I was there working for Saudi Arabian government oh. at that stage, yes. And then I went and lived in went across to the, a sultanate of Oman for five years, mm-hmm. where I was the head nurse of the primary health care department for nursing there. And, um, you know, I used to take uh, medical students out on field trips and and, and work with, with the locals. And, oh, it's a fantastic country, that is. Um, my heart, part of my heart remains there. What's so fantastic about it? Um, Again, it was a country that hadn't really been open to the West. It Oman. was Oman mm. in those days. Um, the Sultan was a much loved man. It was a very benevolent. The people were wonderful. I, I explored. I became the secretary of the historic society over there. I explored the place from from mountain top to to, to, to valley. You know, mm. I saw um, I saw things that no one else had ever you know had seen before because historians hadn't been in there and mm. archaeologists were were rare. So, and having that background in art history that I did was mm. immensely helpful because I'd go, oh, you know, that's a um, you know, that's a, uh, an early, you know, such and such or whatever. Oh, that's, a, that's reminiscent of at least. And, right. You know, and so because of my art history background, um, suddenly there was this dimension to me that nobody else had had. And people would talk to me because it was, it was a subject that I knew, I knew a, a bit about. And they loved the fact that I'd actually taken a lot of interest. And I was also, to my disappointment, one of the first, one of the early people who really tried to learn Arabic mm-hmm. because if you can communicate in a language with people you just get enormous respect mm. and I think they just, you know, you're in their mm. country mm. learn the language mm. there were people there living there for years and years and years who never ever learned Arabic mm. when I came back out of the Middle East I found myself working at a hospital in 
in Melbourne, I used to work, you know, I used to come back and just do casual work in, in the emergency department and and it was at the time when we get, they were having a lot of migration of um, Middle Eastern people into into Australia. And they had no translators and they had no no Arabic doctors. And so, you know, um, you would never, it would never happen nowadays, mm. but, you know, I had to go and say, do you have a fever? Have you got mm, any pain? Mm, you know, yeah. um, and so did a lot, did a bit of translating right. as well as working. You, you, you're turning into a wonderful ad for arts degrees, I just have to say. Like, like you know, you hear so many people talking these days about why would anyone do an arts degree? And that's what you did along with your nursing and, and look how helpful it was and look what you got out of it. Particularly, you know, um, you, you've gathered by now that I really like remote places and I love exploring and I think... I often wish I'd been an early explorer, but um, you know, I was. I worked in Gaza, in Palestine, mm. for um, on and off for about three years, and do you know, I got taken to. Sh- I got taken to some amazing, um, you know, historical sites that, and and seen some Christian sites that no one else has seen. I don't right. know where they are, of mm. course, because I didn't have. A, we didn't have a map in those days. Mm. It was by the third, you know, third palm tree down the second gulvet by the second, you know, mountain on the right. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the art history degree has just been the most one of the most useful degrees that I've actually had. So good, mm. great. And okay, so where else were you working at during that time? Well, well, I've worked in um, I I've worked in I've worked in Sudan. I've worked in Oman. I've worked in parts of Africa. Um, I have worked in Indonesia. I was in Indonesia for twice actually for a whole year after the tsunami. I worked mm. in the tsunami. I've Worked in all the Pacific Islands, um, and I was and I led the Oxfam team in Iraq into after the Russians were scrambling away. Right. So, and again, you know, um, knowledge of the culture mm. was kept us all safe because after the um, the Russians had left, um, I came in via Kuwait with with the team and not knowing what to expect or what to find, and. Um, you know, I always tell people there are when you're working overseas, there are three absolute golden rules that you ha- you ha- you must know working in aid and development, and that's context, context, context. Right. Mm. You know, know mm. who 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 the people are that mm. you're working for. Mm. Know the country. Know the culture. Know as much as you can about the place. Um, and we'd only been there maybe like less than six weeks when the security situation started unraveling for for, for us aid workers, despite Iraq. the America Iraq, yep. despite the Americans leaving and the Brits mm. taking over. Mm. And um, there was and there's there's always you you never there's often never visible there's always an invisible power structure that mm. we probably don't often get to see so while there may be formal structures in place it's the informal that really wield the power in a lot of places where there's instability Mm. so you've really got to know how to how to find it and how to manage it anyway we knew that an imam had come into town so I took my team covered my head wore my black abaya and went to meet him and um because the situation was was getting you know and you know other NGO had ever done that had 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 the presence to go and introduce themselves and meet them and take them with their team. That guaranteed our safety. You said the situation was getting. Finish that sentence. What was Hairy. It was getting. It was. De- it was mm. deteriorating, and we mm. were at the point where were we able to stay? Right. You know, because I'm not sure if you're aware, but the you know humanitarian workers used to say that we we had a, a space within which we worked and we were independent mm. and neutral, but. That's been eroded, and now aid workers are targeted mm. more frequently. There's much more deaths. There's a lot, you know, that space. It's called the diminishing humanitarian space. We don't have a lot right. of it anymore. It was deteriorating. We were able to stay, and um, the this imam who who was the power broker for the south, he guaranteed our safety. Um, mm. Said we we, were, we would be safe, mm. um, and and we were for as long as. As possible, but we did have to leave. And so, what takes you from from all that work, that, that on the ground, hands on work in these far flung, far flung places, to sitting down, I'm guessing with a laptop, and writing a crime novel? It's an adventure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's simply an amazing adventure, and I'm just writing an adventure. Yeah. And one of the things is is that um, I initially started to write that first book as an autobiography, mm. and I actually thought I was a bit boring. <laughs> so I thought, 
what if I throw a, if I put a body around yep. around it? Maybe this will make the, the story more interesting. What I didn't know was that that was a very natural thing to have done because crime writing is by default about inequality, and it's a lens through which we can view society. And a lot of um, yeah, a lot of writers do use you know victims and and the police and power structures to actually point out social issues. Mm. So it was made for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and did you did you write? Where were you when you started writing the book? In Australia. Uh-huh. Mm, I started writing the book in Australia, mm. and um, I have to tell you, the first attempt wasn't great. Okay. So I left it for a while. Yeah. I thought, and I told everybody, I said, I'm going to write a book. Yeah. And um, I've been telling everyone for years I was going to write a book, and um, and then when I did, I thought, oh, I'm not very good at it. And um, but you know, I I knew that. I thought that time was wasted that I'd spent because I gave up work and I thought, right, I'm going to write this book. Right. I gave up work and in the end, after 18 months, realised actually it wasn't very good. And I thought for a while that I'd actually wasted 18 months of my life and I was pretty cross with myself. But in actual fact, it was the best thing I could have done because mm. it showed me what I needed to do to get better mm-hmm. as a writer. So what did you need to do? Well, I needed to go to a few classes. I, need to, I needed to explore the genre. I needed mm. to know words like, um, like a tone and voice mm-hmm. and, 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 and the structure of a novel. And I needed to actually start reading critically. Um, but with that, I was absolutely adamant that I wasn't going to be influenced by other writers. I needed to write my own. And, um, but I also wanted a crime story that was reflective of, of the multicultural, you know, tumultuous life that, mm. that, that I'd had. And, mm. and, and, and in some ways, um, the moral ambiguity of, the, of some of the areas that I worked in. Mm. Mm. For reasons of their own poem by um, Henry Lawson Mm -hmm. they lie the men who tell us for reasons of their own that want us here a stranger in misery unknown so that's from from an Australian poem right right. Mm. and and, uh, so so you went back and you rewrote everything once you no once I decided to put a body in it I was right Uh ah yeah no (laughs) no and in fact I was working in Melbourne and um and I was taking the train from where I lived into the city, and I would pass this this area of dark black swamp. Mm-hmm. And in my head, I used to think, "Oh, there's a body in there. What if there, mm-hmm. if I was going to mm-hmm. kill somebody, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd put them in there." Mm-hmm. That became the scene for my oh, probably giving a bit much away, but that mm-hmm. became the scene for my for my murder. That uh-huh. particular area of swamp. Mm. And someone's seeing it from a train. Are you someone who sort of thinks about sort of the the darker side of human nature a lot? Do you need to be able to do that to be a crime writer? I'm a pantser. A pantser? I'm a pantser. What's a pantser? Writers tend to fall into two categories, plotters and pantsers. And a plotter is someone that says, OK, I'm going to write a story and it's going to have this character, these this, these events, this is going to happen, this is the red herring, and they write it, they spend quite a bit of time, they have the whole thing completely structured. Mm. And a pantser is someone like me who goes, A is going to kill B, and for that reason, uh-huh. and then you just wing it. You, you write by the seat of your pants. Ah, got it. So... Riding by the seat of my pants, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh-huh. I really don't know what's going to happen. Okay. Um, sometimes I don't think you need to go that dark mm. to make to make a point because you know what, murder happens in the brightest of lights. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know? Good quote. So yeah. And and, uh, and your detective is Robbie Gray. Oh yeah. Mm. So my are de- you Robbie Gray? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Okay. But not much. I can remember the day I sat down and thought, right. I've, I need a detective, mm. and I need a woman, mm. and I need to call her something. And um, I do, I did read a lot, and I do read a lot of crime. And I'm very, very fond of Colin Dexter, who wrote Morse. So Robbie Gray is named after actually Robbie Lewis, mm. and I just had that we that we tweak. And then Robbie Gray is the lead character. Her, her surname Gray came because I closed my eyes and ran my hand around my bookshelf and landed on Gray's Anatomy. Okay. So I was happy with Robbie Gray. I thought, mm. yeah, that sounds pretty good, you mm. know. She's, mm. you know. However, when I'd finished the novel, I um, overheard a, an expert in crime writing say, if you have a main character, make sure they do not have a wishy-washy name like Gray. 
or oh, beige. Okay. Or, and I'm thinking, oh, well, that's, that's stuff up that. number one. Mm. However, when you start writing your character and you, your characters grow and develop, and Robbie Gray is grey. Mm. I mean, mm. she's this character that straddles right and wrong and she's and she doesn't always think black is white so she's actually perfectly named mm. i love her do you spend times uh conversing with robbie in your I, head i do yeah i do do you ever do that out loud oh, no i you try sure? not to <laughs> <laughs> i was just thinking sometimes in the car maybe you know stuck in traffic uh, have a chat to robbie Oh, no, no, but um, but I'm always thinking about my live in their world. If, you know, um, people say to me, oh, do you read when you write? Mm. And I go, listen, I'm writing, I live in the real world. I, I'm writing Robbie's world. Mm. No, I actually don't think I've got time for it for another another third world. So I tend not to read when, I, when I'm writing other books, that is. Fair enough. Um, so, so for reasons of their own, won the Naya Marsh Award for first novel. Debut novel. First de- debut mm. novel in 2021. That must have felt good. It did indeed. Yeah. It was pretty exciting. And, and for some reason you had some sort of, there was something in your past about Naya Marsh. What yeah. was the Naya Marsh connection in the, your past? When I was at school in Eddington Convent, mm. and I was about 10, the nuns asked us to write to somebody famous. Mm. And um, I didn't know anybody famous. I mean, you know, we're a Catholic family from, you know, Eddington. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I must have somehow heard of, of Naya Marsh, because I ended up writing to her, and she lived around the road from us up in Kashmir. Mm. Um, it was only like well, after I'd won the Naya Marsh Award that people sort of brought that up, and I thought... Why did I write to her? I mean, what what was it about Naya Marsh? I mean, no one else in my class did. I remember mm. that. And then when I look back at the records, it was the same year that she was made a dame. And I must have been thinking, oh, that's really that's cool. You know, it's pretty cool Flash. being a dame. Mm. No, one, no one else has got a dame yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. writing to. So that's, that's how that came about. Uh, Never met the woman, no. Uh, interesting. But a portrait remains in my in my uh, in my house in okay. my writing room. Mm. Right. So so once you could call yourself an award winning writer, did that feel good? Well, I already had already won an Australian uh, Rural Writing Award. Okay. Previous to that. Mm. Mm. So. Um, did that help though? Um, give you the confidence to write your second novel? What happened to me was I'd always banged on that I wanted to to write a book. What happened when I wrote when I was writing the the, the first novel? was that I realised, actually, I didn't want to write a book. I wanted to be a writer. Mm. And that mm. was a huge, huge difference. Yeah. You know, and... What is the difference? Well, the difference, if you want to write a book, it's like you've ticked off something and you've, and you've achieved it. Yep. You know, wanting to be a writer is going to be a lifelong thing for me. It's this purpose, it's this passion, it's mm. this drive, it's this creativity, it's this, hey, you know, it's fantastic hard sometimes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's up and down. Yeah. Has its moments. Has its its highs and lows, you know. Um, you so know, flushed with success from winning the award. <laughs> hardly and met. getting your first book out, you start on your second book. I the, do. The Glasgow Smile. The Glasgow Smile. Which for some reason I, makes me think of the expression a Liverpool kiss. Do you know that expression? Well, it's the same. I think they can call it a Glasgow kiss as well. Headbutt. It's, yeah, but yeah. A, a Glasgow smile is is different, uh-huh. and the Glasgow smile is not really about the slashing of the lips, Ooh. okay, and from ear to ear uh-huh. <laughs> because you because you've been naughty. Uh-huh. The essence of the story is about is about how people walk around wearing masks. Mm. So that he's you know constantly smiling this particular figure, mm-hmm. but underneath that there's a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. And the the analogy of um, of wearing masks and inside everyone, inside every person, you think you know, mm. there's someone you don't know. Sure. So I did divert away from the humanitarian theme for for this one, mm-hmm. but it um, but Robbie Gray does pick up some of the aspects in her first case. And do you like? Because I love movies and I love you know, I love. Netflix and Apple TV and Disney Plus. I love. I think. I think the streaming service is is the greatest art form of our time right now. You know. I think. I love movies as well. But what you can do with a, with a, a really beautifully produced, brilliantly directed, brilliantly written series without ads is something really amazing. Do you ever think about Robbie making an appearance 
on the big screen or the smaller screen? Oh, absolutely. In fact, when I won the award, they said this is a series, right? which is why I wrote the second book. I mean, I didn't, didn't know that it would make a series, but certainly when the... Um, when the editor looked at it, he said, this is a series, mm. and, and then when I won the award, this is a series mm-hmm. that, that needs to happen. And um, so I thought, well, how do you write a series? I mean, how do you write a series? Do you do you write standalones? Mm. Do, you, do your characters grow? I mean, this, you know, this was um, building the plane mm. in many as ways as it. I was flying mm. it. So do you, could you imagine uh, your books being turned better into a film or into a series, a TV series? It would depend. I think that my book would probably niggle at the politics of Australia a little bit. I think the first book has got, has, has got the power to, um, to really highlight uh, in many ways, you know, some of the, of the social issues that Australia still face and that have, have you know reverberated across the ditch here as well particularly with the second book um, you know uh, which has uh, um, which is set in, in Melbourne but still has some New Zealand characters in it because Robbie's a New Zealander working in, in in Melbourne and that's what I love I love the fact that that, that I'm writing a book that's actually multicultural, multifaceted, and that talks about with an Aboriginal character that looks around and suddenly he's dealing with all these people demonstrating, you know, send the Muslims home, and he realises that he's the only Indigenous person there. Everyone else, mm. the, the police, everyone around him mm. are imports. Mm. It's, you know, the irony of, 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 of life and mm. the injustice sometimes. Right. Mm. Um, what's going to happen next with Robbie? Well, I'm not going to write any more. I'm doing a third different one. I've written two, yeah. and I think the third one is going to be a standalone okay. one. Mm-hmm. And then I may go back to go her. Back to mm. mm-hmm. what's, the, what's the third novel going to be then? It's set between uh, New Zealand and overseas, mm-hmm. and uh, it's, an, it's going to cross borders a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm. But it's a crime. More crime? More crime. Another body? Another body. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Nobody loves me. <laughs> Everybody loves me. As a woman writer, like one of the things that troubles me, like I, I love thrillers, um, but I get really tired of shows, books, films, which are about men killing and terrifying women. It's such a cliche, and it keeps being done over and over and over again. Do you ever get frustrated with that as well? Sometimes I think that there's too much emphasis placed on the killer. Mm-hmm. You know, I think so I like motive. What's mm-hmm. the motive? And particularly in my second book, The Glasgow Smile, mm. the emphasis is on the motive um, uh, rather than the perpetrator. And the trouble is, though, Matt, is that more men perpetrate crimes mm. against uh, women. Yep. So it's a given. And also, we need to start digging even deeper. I mean, I had to do a lot of research on strangling, mm-hmm. believe it or not. Mm-hmm. And... You know, that was fascinating to think that, you know, when someone is strangling, they've got two, like two and a half to three minutes for them to change their mind to stop before mm. someone will mm. actually die. Mm. Um, and the big difference between strangling and garroting and, um, you know... <laughs> Can I keep going? <laughs> no, I keep thinking... We've never that, talked about garroting people I mean, on the Nelson Pods, so I keep sometimes, going. I used to think when I was writing my first book, God, someone's going to knock on my door and say, Look, you know, what are you doing? You mm, know? Mm. And they do say that crime writers can make really good murderers. Mm. But, um, you know, so you end up going down some really interesting, um, you know, medical, medical stuff to get it right because right. you want to... You want your books to be as real as and genuine as possible. One of my pet hates in movies, and um, it's particularly in movies rather than, the, than than in books, when people are strangling other people, they always kill them way too quickly. It yeah, seems they do. to me. It takes two. Yeah, yeah. It takes a good three minutes normally. All right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Another one that really annoys me is when people are supposed to be good swimmers. Yeah. Right, and then they jump into the pool and they start swimming, and if you know anything about swimming, you look at them and go, that person's not a very good swimmer. No, like just attention to detail. What about someone hard, being shot the other day and they get up and they and they and they, and they jump in the car and they drive off no, and they've been shot in the side? Ridiculous. Yeah. Mm. No, in fact, you've really got to make it as, as as genuine as possible. And I do have medical people. I do have a, a, a police consultant. And I even went to Melbourne 
to make, and I met the uh, one of the heads of the Forensic Institute of Forensic Medicine in Melbourne to make sure that I got the autopsy room right. Not that I'm, I do, I focus on autopsies or anything, but it's the process of what it's like when you are sitting outside a room and in an autopsy room and someone comes out and says, well, you know, they've, they've, they've died of this and... Where's, what hallway are they standing mm. in? What are they leaning mm-hmm. against? What what books are there for them to read? Those real details mm. that make make it um, authentic. Of, authentic. Yeah. Mm. So, do you think maybe in another life, you know, if you could, if you could, I know you've had a fascinating career, but if you could go back, would you want to be a detective? No, because a lot of the work that I did as an aid work, in in many ways, is about finding vulnerable people. It's about analysing the context of the situation I'm in. It's about working out who's who and what's what. Mm. It's about trying to identify the context and, and, and try and find a better way for people. I think that's much more powerful than being a single detective. Yeah, and enough. also I get to I get to be detective again in my in my in my books now. Yeah, yeah. So no, and I don't think I would have had the wisdom Mm-hmm. As a writer, maybe mm-hmm. 30 years ago. Mm. I feel a bit more wisdomy now. Cool. So, um, Nelson, how did you end up here? Oh, that was interesting. Mm. Well, I felt like I needed to come back to New Zealand. There was just this thing, and I thought, oh, that must mean I'm getting old. You know, does this mean I'm ageing? I need to, I, I'm, I'm, maybe felt like I need, a change. I need, need to come home. I need. I think what it was was, as, as an aid worker and living in so many different places, I'd lost a sense of where home was. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, you know, and I needed a sense of place before I died. I found it very hard to live in New Zealand um, in, in those intervening 25 years that I was away mm-hmm. because I just kind of felt so disconnected. Like, mm-hmm. nobody, in those early days, nobody could pronounce Muhammad, let alone Al Qaeda, mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. and I was sort of seeing things and witnessing things, and I couldn't even talk about it, or no one understood if mm-hmm. I tried to talk about it. So it was it was only you know seven years ago that I th- thought maybe I'm ready to come back or maybe you know can I fit back in into this into New Zealand can I fit mm. and I wasn't sure if I could and I had a choice of two places in my head I either Nelson or Queenstown I thought being an expatriate that maybe I wouldn't settle anywhere else very easily mm-hmm. and I ended up in Nelson mm. which I think was probably a better choice than Queenstown. And what was it that that made Nelson win that competition? I think that Nelson had for me the safe, the the things that I wanted to do but wasn't able to do before. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the brilliant walks, the freedom, mm-hmm. the space. My house doesn't overlook anybody. Um, like all I see is the sea and the mountains, mm-hmm. and I need I need that space. Mm-hmm. So um, it's a very gentle place. I couldn't have lived here any earlier than this. It wasn't it's not exciting enough for me. Mm. It is now. Mm-hmm. I remember when I left New Zealand, people would say to me, oh, why are you leaving? I'd say, I can't live on scenery, I'm off. You know what, now I can. I'm very happy to live on scenery. So when you say it's exciting enough for you now, what's exciting about Nelson today? Well, what's exciting is that I have a lovely group of friends. I am very, very busy. Um I uh, love the beaches, I love my dogs, I walk them along the beach. I, I've just been to Europe for two months, I have friends all over the world, um, which is just incredible. And I feel very lucky, Great. I feel really a lucky girl. And do you think being a Nelson helps you as a writer? No. Ah. In fact, definitely not. <laughs> that's the only downside. Okay. I must admit, that's the one thing, you know, I sit in my in my room and I look out my, my writing room and the sea's sparkling, the sun's glorious, and I just want to be outside. Mm. I've got to draw the drapes. Mm. And in fact, one of the things I'm going to do is that I'm going to um, actually move to a location that I write about so that I that I, I'm not, you know, yearning to be outside mm-hmm. um, like I am in Nelson a lot of the time. And Nelson's, like, where do you put a body on sparkling, beautiful beaches and things? Oh, I mean, be. it's very hard to find. You could put a body on a sparkling beach. That'd be oh, interesting. Oh, yes, but it's not, it's not, it hasn't got the atmosphere or hasn't got the, you know, it hasn't not got moody the... moody enough? Not moody enough. Mm. You know, not like a... Like a uh, a nice um, gold mining hole in the West Coast, or a, oh, there you go. You know, Boulder Bank under this a few boulders could be mm. quite good, but mm. um, or you know, one of the walking paths on Abel Tasman. Yeah, I do think. I mean, I'm yeah. always looking for places to hide Sick bodies. bodies. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. That's really <laughs> <nice>. <laughs>
<laughs> so, so you're going to stick around? I am. Yeah, nice. And uh, do you have an idea, like you are a writer now, like you didn't just write a book, you are a writer, an award-winning writer, a multi-award-winning writer, in fact. Uh, how many books do you think you've got in you? Five. You know this? I you think figured so. figured it out? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you know what each of those books are going to be? Sort of. Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. And how many of them feature Robbie? I don't know. Okay. I just know. I keep saying, now listen here, Lord above. Yep. Give me five. It's all I ask is five. Okay. If I can get any more, th- more than five, would be really great. But, yeah, yeah. you know, I would not... I think life is so uncertain at the moment. I think we're living in, in times that are quite um, unclear. Mm. So while I like to think that I could do it, I can't even predict what next two years will be like. Ten years ago, you'd say, oh, when I'm 15, I'm going to go off and do this. Or when I'm mm. 20, I'm going to go off and do this. Mm. I don't think you can say that anymore mm-hmm. with certainty. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think it's unstable. Mm-hmm. And it worries me. Okay. Well, perhaps that's also fertile territory for writing crime novels. So maybe you can tap into that and put yeah. that in your books. Yeah, I do. Mm. I, I, I did. I mean, I, I, I look at some of the events that happen now, and I think, where did they begin? Mm-hmm. You know, um, particularly in like the Glasgow Smile, mm. you know, we had the the, the, the mosque shooting um, here, which was awful, but the seeds of white supremacy were in Australia bubbling away. You know. Yeah, well, the killer came from Australia. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so you know, unbelievable. It, yeah, so that still blows my mind. Yeah, so mm. but the stirrings of white the number of. Mm. Of, of, of white supremacy groups that are existing in Australia in, nine, in 2014. Quite, mm. quite a few. Mm. They're all named. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, how do you feel about Australia's future? Well, all I can say is if they don't vote yes in that referendum, mm. I fear. I mm. fear for Australia. Mm. They have to say yes. Mm. And it looks like, from what I heard on the radio this morning, the no's are gaining traction. How can you not include Aboriginals in your constitution? Mm. I... I it defies belief, mm. but and the referendum has to take place for any change in their constitution. So yeah, yeah. I think it's very worrying. Yeah, are you, are you more optimistic about New Zealand, Aotearoa, New Zealand? Well, that's as I said, that's that's the reason I was actually able to come back and settle here because in the twenty five years I'd been away, there's this huge multicultural push. Mm. There's this huge language. There's there's all the things that I was used to, the mm. prayer calls, the karakias in mm. the morning. I mean I'd been doing that for years, the prayer the prayers before meetings and things, mm. you know, speaking other languages, mm. being familiar and comfortable. Yeah. Loved it. Yeah. Think this is just so important. Mm. It's the rope that's going to bind us together. Mm. Mm. So more optimistic about New yeah, Zealand. Yes, abs- absolutely. But then we've got whole different parameters. I mean, mm. we're a small country. We speak one language. Mm. You well, know, it's a two. massive. Co- oh, mm. at least yes, at least. Yeah. But not like Australia, where there's, you know, three hundred dialects of Aboriginal. It's very, very difficult. Mm. Much more challenging. Mm. I did political science for a year. I remember comparing the two. Mm. Yeah, well, I prefer it on the side of the ditch. I understand why people get attracted to um, the big lights, the bright lights, the big cities, the bright lights, um, and the bigger salaries, but there's more to life than that. And I th- I think, I've always felt, you know, I was very fortunate. I grew up and travelled a lot, spent time in my 20s um, in Asia and time in the States, and I I love it. I love it here. I just, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a New Zealander. I want to live in New Zealand. I want to raise our children in New Zealand. And... That, that doesn't mean I agree with you know a lot of what goes on here, but it is home, and I dig it. And um, it's great that you're digging it too. <laughs> I am. Hey, Chris, very nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time and your stories. When will your third book come out? I don't know. I would say a couple of years. Okay. Well, good luck over the next two years writing that book. Thank you very we much. Hope, we hope that uh, plenty of excitement comes your way one way or another here in Whakatū. And again, really, really great to talk to you. Thanks, Matt. Much appreciated. Thank you.